Right. Fired by the body and fairly lumped. In the former category are carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. These are required by the body for warmth and for energy, and the proteins also for building up the fabric of the body. Then there are the mineral elements and the vitamins, which we require in very small quantity. There is one food which has most of these elements in just about the proportion that the body needs, and this food is milk. So nature has provided a universal food. Almost every nutrient is there in the amount we need, with one unimportant exception. In that case, nature has made its own compensation in a way which we shall discuss later. Let us see what a chemical analysis of milk reveals. For this, I shall hand you over to my colleague. Curiously enough, as much as 87% is water, which is the most vital ingredient of our diet. Many solid foods, fruit in particular, contain this amount of water. Meat and fish may contain 75%. But now let us see in a diagram how the remainder is made up in human milk. About 7% is carbohydrate, roughly 3.5% is fat, about 2% protein. Cow's milk has more protein and less carbohydrate. The remaining quarter of 1% contains mineral elements and vitamins. When analyzed, this small proportion is found to contain an astonishing number of chemical substances. They all appear also in the solid foods of a normal adult diet, but nowhere altogether as they do in milk. So let's stick to milk and see what an analysis of that quarter of 1% reveals. Taking the mineral elements first, occur as simple compounds, usually salts. Some seem to play no part in the functioning of the body. Others, sodium for example, are vital. Most of our sodium comes from ordinary salt, sodium chloride. In the blood, it regulates the overall water content of the body. Excess amounts are excreted in urine and sweat. Only those whose conditions cause them to sweat profusely are likely to run short. Sodium deficiency may lead to a form of cramp but this can, of course, be corrected by increasing the intake of salt, beer being a popular source. All the mineral elements are distributed by the bloodstream, but one of them, iron, is required by the blood itself. The red corpuscles contain hemoglobin, which conveys oxygen throughout the body. The heme part of hemoglobin is believed to have this chemical formula. Its one iron atom is in the center, and the whole complex molecule around it. Iron occurs in such foods as meats, liver, cocoa, peas, beans, and lentils. A shortage leads to anemia. Curiously enough, there is hardly any iron in milk. A baby, for the first few months of its life, lives on a store it has accumulated from its mother before birth. Milk, however, contains a lot of calcium, important for children because it is absorbed into their growing bones and teeth, making them hard and strong. Phosphorus and small quantities of magnesium and fluorine are also needed by bones and teeth. An isotope of another element similarly enters the bones, radioactive strontium-90, originating in the fallout from thermonuclear explosion. Its presence may give rise to cancer. Iodine. Only a millionth of an ounce is required daily. It is taken up by only one organ of the body, the thyroid gland, in which it is used to produce the hormone thyroxine. Deficiency leads to goiter, with a characteristic swelling in the neck due to an enlargement of the gland. The most important source of iodine is the sea, and the element occurs particularly in sea food. Deficiency is therefore rare in coastal areas. Iodine is also found in vegetables which have been grown near the sea. Nowadays in Britain, fish and vegetables containing iodine are widely distributed inland, and because we are a small island, 
serious iodine deficiency is rare. Potassium. All the organs of the body seem to need this element. Without it, for example, the heart would not continue to beat. The study of mineral elements is unending and many more examples could be given. But now let's turn to vitamins. As long ago as 1601, it was found that the inclusion of oranges and lemons in the diet on board ships of the East India Company prevented scurvy among sailors. And in the 19th century, the Japanese Navy ordered changes in diet to cure beriberi. But nobody knew what caused these diseases or how the cures were effected. And then, in 1906, Sir Frederick Gowland Hopkins conducted a now famous experiment. A number of rats were fed on a diet of purified carbohydrates, fats, protein, mineral salts and water. This should have been adequate according to the knowledge of the time, but something was obviously lacking, for in a short time the rats began to exhibit malnutrition, they became listless and they lost weight. When a little milk had been added to their food, they began to recover. What was lacking in the purified diet? One by one, the missing essentials were discovered, isolated, and given the genetic name, vitamins. Deficiency of any one was shown to give rise to a characteristic disease. Xerophthalmia, beriberi, pellagra, scurvy, rickets, and so on. But what exactly are the vitamins? and how does the body use them? In any living cell, hundreds of essential chemical substances are being synthesized all the time, but some others the body cannot make. These are the vitamins, which have to be supplied from outside sources, often in a very roundabout way. Small sea fish live on even smaller ones, whose diet of marine algae contains carotene, which becomes converted to vitamin A in their livers. They, in their turn, are eaten, and thus the vitamin eventually finds its way to the nursery in one form or another, the best being probably plain cod liver oil. The same parent substance, carotene, also exists in grass, from which it is converted by hens into vitamin A, found in the yolk of eggs they lay. We too can convert carotene from vegetables into vitamin A, and carrots are a very good source. Vitamin D often naturally occurs together with vitamin A, but it can be manufactured by the human body using the action of ultraviolet light on the skin. Children need this vitamin more than adults because its presence enables calcium to enter the bones and so prevent rickets. Next, vitamin C, which comes mainly from fruit and vegetables. It is strange that in the whole animal kingdom, this vitamin is required only by one or two species, including the guinea pig, the monkey, and man. Other animals manufacture vitamin C in their bodies. A feature of this vitamin is the fact that it is soluble in water. Vegetable water containing the vitamin C, however, need not be wasted and should be used, for example, for making gravy. Also soluble in water are all the members of the vitamin B complex, some or all of which are found in eggs, bacon, meat, liver, cheese and pulses. Like all vitamins, those of the B complex are organic compounds with fairly large molecules such as vitamin B1 and riboflavin. An exception is nicotinic acid, which chemically is quite simple and relatively easy to synthesize. Fifteen different vitamins have so far been isolated. There may be more remaining to be discovered. And we are still only just beginning to understand how they do their jobs. In conclusion, let us look back at some of the unexpected sources from which both the mineral elements and the vitamins come to us. They make up only a tiny percentage of the food we eat, but their existence is essential to life.